Hello, everyone. I'm Anne Marie Beal, minister of Unity Church of the Cumberlands. Today, for our metaphysical Bible interpretation class, we were going to look at the story of Nehemiah in the Old Testament. You're probably asking, how did I come up with that one, right? Well, it was an interesting time because back then for the Israelites, it was a time of hope. They had been in captivity for so long, and they were recovering. They'd lost sight of who they were, and they'd strayed from their values and high ideals. And so Nehemiah came to help bring them back to those higher ideals. I like to compare that to what I call the time of the virus, where many people are saying, you know what? We're all learning what's really important again. We're kind of returning to those loving acts of kindness and, and what's really important in the world. Well, Charles Fillmore, the co-founder of Unity, in his Metaphysical Bible Dictionary, talked about Nehemiah. He said, Nehemiah is that part of us which inspires us to higher and better things. He had the boldness and the courage it took to bring about the rebuilding of character so if you look at the world of 2020, it's very polarized, them against us kind of mentality. You have the gap between the wealthy and the poor. You have the friction between the liberals and the conservatives, even the optimists and the pessimists. You've heard the old joke about the difference between an optimist and a pessimist. The optimist says, we live in the best possible world. And the pessimist says, yeah, I'm afraid he's right. <laughs> well, I grew up in a family that sort of shows how those energies of opposites can live together in love. You see, there are five of us sisters. Two of us are liberals and two are conservative. And then there's my sister who's Down syndrome. And she is the presence of love in the midst of us. Even if we don't always understand each other, there is that presence of love that unites us. So bringing that back to Nehemiah, there's a new phrase now in the world called spiritual activism. And it means taking transformative action for the world and for ourselves with compassion and kindness. So let's compare that Nehemiah in the past to modern day spiritual activism. Now the king sent Nehemiah to rebuild his nation and when Nehemiah saw the state that the nation was in he just sat down and wept. Very similar to the story of Jesus looking out at Jerusalem and it says he wept. And it's the same for those of us who look out on the world right now and cry for it, for how far we've strayed from those high ideals. So let's look at the three components of spiritual activism. Well, the first component is to take action that is transformative from a place of compassion not from our egoic reactions on what's happening. And we ask ourselves, we ask the Holy Spirit, what is mine to do here? What loving act of kindness can I do to transform this part of the world or that inner world inside myself? The second component is Nehemiah helped restore those high ideals bring people back to their values again. So he had all the Israelites fast and pray. Now in unity, when we talk about fasting, we talk about fasting from toxic thinking. It's so easy to slip into toxic thinking at times like this. And then we pray until we remember the truth of our being, until we remember who we are again one with God and one with each other. Now the third part of spiritual activism is bringing people together again. You see, 
the people in Nehemiah's time, the Israelites, had scattered. They were living apart from each other, and he brought them all together into one city because he knew their strength in unity. A house divided cannot stand. And right now we are a house divided. Modern-day quantum mechanics shows how we're really all entangled with each other. And what we think and do affects each other. And once we return to our awareness of our oneness, we know that it can only come from love and compassion. And the whole world begins to change. Charles Filmer went on to say that when we have lived in limiting conditions and accepted that as inevitable, only the inspiration and courage that is inspired by a Nehemiah state of mind will enable us to rebuild a spiritual consciousness. Those who have once been aware of the divine presence and have lost that awareness understand the great necessity for regaining it. Now that's not always easy and there's a lot of interference. Memories come up inside of us, emotional reactions, fears. The Israelites had post-traumatic stress. They were afraid to rebuild because they thought invaders would just come in and restore what they had rebuilt. So Nehemiah gathered together two crews, one to build and one to protect that which they build, to protect them from raiding invaders. Now in the story of our consciousness, all raiding invaders are simply states of mind that come upon us that are toxic states of mind. So we rebuild our consciousness through our spiritual practice and we protect ourselves from the raiders of toxic thinking and negativity that embark us all around us. Nehemiah also came up with four laws to help his nation and to heal that split division. Some are kind of hard to take literally, but if you look at them metaphysically, what is that in me? They make a little more sense. The first one is no intermarrying. Back then, the them against us was the Jews and the Gentiles. We could say that today about anyone different from us. And that is racist, and God would never make a law that was racist. But if you look at this metaphysically, what is he really saying here? Jesus said you cannot serve two masters. You either welcome love or fear. And you cannot marry love or fear. They cannot coexist with each other. So Charles Fillmore, when he was interpreting this metaphysically, said don't adulterate or marry pure spiritual ideals with non-spiritual concepts. And I think today in the world, we are trying to marry our spiritual ideals with some very non-spiritual concepts. That's what's being healed today. The second law was a very practical law. Support your temple with your ties. Now, that simply means support your spiritual consciousness by supporting your source of spiritual nourishment and keep up your spiritual practice to maintain and protect from negative, toxic thinking. The third law was to observe the Sabbath. For them it was Saturday, for us it's Sunday. But it's not about the day of the week. The Sabbath is taking a rest and restoring your soul, restoring your spirit back to its high ideals of truth, of love, of compassion. And the fourth and final law was to observe the sabbatical year. Now that's something we don't talk about anymore. But for them, every seventh year, the th couple things they did, every seventh year, they let the land rest. It's good farming practice. Every seven years, let that ran land rest to restore itself. Every seventh year, they also let all debts 
be released. It was the first bankruptcy law. Can you imagine, now let's look at this metaphysically. Every seven years, what if we forgave? What if the whole world, every seven years, totally forgave everyone else? Talk about spiritual transformation. Talk about spiritual activism. At the time of this virus, call forth your own inner Nehemiah consciousness to return yourself and the world around you back to our higher ideals and our values. And we ask the Holy Spirit, what is my part? What am I to do? Maybe it's just a simple act of loving kindness. But each one of us, uniting together, can restore ourselves and the world. So, have a good week. God bless.